Welcome to a special segment. This is a community segment with uh, special guests. Today we have with us uh, Dr. Claudia Kotka from Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome, doctor. Thank you very much. Dr. Claudia Kotka, three times graduate of University of Michigan, a BS in chemistry degree and cellular molecular biology. MPH Toxicology and uh, DDS, an international lecturer and uh, aesthetic restorative and sleep disorder dentist, founded the Washington Institute for Dentistry and Laser Surgery in Washington, D.C. Doctor, tell us a little bit more about your uh, institute. What do you do over there? Of course. So, first of all, I'd like to thank you. Uh, it's a privilege and honor to be uh, joining RTN, uh, um, uh, uh, Chicago uh, TV. Uh, thank you very much for um, welcoming us. Um, what uh, we do here specifically is a unique platform uh, that corresponds in terms of developing innovative, customized clinical protocols for every patient. And how we do that is uh, through the development and coordination of two different entities, a clinical practice and a think tank. The think tank focuses basically on clinical protocol development, innovation, particularly in the treatment aspect, but also in the integration of the technology itself. And so uh, with that, we really uh, are honored and again and, and privileged to be able to render real-time customizations, not just to, of course, patients from DC Metro, but across the United States as well as the world. I'm impressed to see uh, on your uh, brief bio here that you also serve as an expert on the ADA Standards Committee on Dental uh, Products. Uh, and you're also um, active uh, expert in Capitol Hill, in uh, testifying before the United States Congress and the, uh, the White House. So uh, you are an expert in the field, and I would really love to get your opinion regarding the most um, important concern, public concern, I should say, uh, which is the, the virus, the COVID, the pandemic. So. Tell us from your perspective, what do you think about this virus, uh, the, the COVID uh, pandemic? So, you know, to answer that question, I just give a little bit of a backdrop. So the coordination in terms of when we look at technology and clinical protocol options, we really have to consider all the participants that deal in the healthcare sector, particularly the healthcare commodity itself. And I've always argued that private health is public health. That means that whatever I do in the clinic here and whatever choice and selection I give as an option to my patients will have direct implication not only on that patient, but their family, their community, and also all the way to the USA Congress. And through that, uh, through the myriad of other components, including and not, of course, excluding others, uh, academia, R&D, industry, investment capital, um, we have the media, the consumer aspects as well. And as a clinician, it's very important to have conversation at the stakeholders table so that the integrity of the options is protected. And at the same time, we really give information that allows for the consumer to be uh, informed fully prior to making a decision. Well, that's, so. uh, that's very, very kind of you. But uh, as you know, media has created a panic that scared a lot of people and uh, people didn't know what to choose. They hear one uh, group say one thing, the, another group say another. So here are the people in the middle dealing with this uh, pandemic and a panic that it's, uh, it's uh, uh, worldwide and they're trying to figure out what's going on so what is going on what do you do you think is is going on with this uh, COVID uh, situation and now they're talking about the vaccine and another wave and the panic continues so what what do you what shall we do who should we listen to exactly so you should listen to the experts number one uh, number two uh, during the COVID um, 
crisis because that's the best way I can I can refer to it. Um, I've given actually expert to expert lectures across the world, starting with Milan um, and then Asia as well as in Romania um, and of course Europe and United States. There is um, some reference of, of the expertise from expert to expert if the audience is interested in actually referencing those and it goes into a lot more detail. But what I want to say is just highlight a couple of those relevant points and I'll start with this. First of all, to practice medicine with a license is a very important privilege and needs to be protected. That means that municipalities, governmental entities, or any other type of entities cannot take precedence. Hence, it's written into law that clinicians are primary caregivers. That means they have the privilege, responsibility, and they're the gatekeepers. So non-experts need to take instruction from the healthcare uh, participants and leaders, and that's depicted. Dentistry is a primary healthcare provider along with doctors. So having said that, we look then to see how is the distribution of healthcare, dis, um, um, I would say, coordinated in the United States, unlike the world. And because we're having a global conversation, and I know that uh, individuals here on the platform are from all over the world, and greetings to all the Romanians in the diaspora as well as in Romania, we will have to understand what the uh, mitigating factors in terms of assumptions with respect to territories. So in the United States, the privilege is given to the expert to actually set rules and laws and it actually controls its own profession. Thereby, it has amazing input in terms of and with credibility and results. And here's an example. In dentistry, we have had 30 plus years of outpatient surgeries without any type of outbreaks, incidences across the United States, in spite of the fact that we've been through the worst pathogens possible. It can't even be comparable to the pathogen of COVID. And I'm talking about HIV, um, um, hepatitis B virus, other, um, other viruses like HPV, for instance, are much more potent. Herpetic viruses are much more potent in imposing a debilitation comorbidities, fatalities. And when we look at both prevalence and incidence rates, you have to recognize as an expert what takes priority. So when we look at basically the options that the patient has with respect to COVID, first of all, it's immune system. Building the immune system is absolutely key. And I, I don't believe you'll find an expert or a scientist who's basically going to argue that um, natural immunity is not the best option given to the human body. It is hands down best selection and is, more the, is the most the comprehensive coordination of um, tackling and winning in real time, but also protecting longitudinally. With respect to the um, other options, therapeutics, for instance, are much more uh, attractive as an option when dealing with infectious conditions. Vaccines are, I would say, the unique vehicles in which there are very specific selections of approaches, but at the same time, the body can only take so much of this particular approach. So when you're dealing with what should you give your body? We have, we're human beings, we have a predetermined start and finish in terms of function. Right. So based on that, you have to always look at how much do I get in exchange for um, the, the cost. And in medicine, particularly in the treatment aspect, there's always a give and take. It's never zero and it's never 100 percent. It's always a coordination between the two. But here's the key. The body, no matter where it's been, if given the right opportunities, it will heal. It will seek to coordinate a response that's productive. So hence, at the Institute, we focus on mechanism-driven therapeutics versus other types of coordination of, you know, coagulative options, tackling the fever through one medication, tackling the swelling through the other medication. Uh, you know, for instance, giving, uh, you know, an anti-vaccine, for instance, to a, a pathogen that could easily 
be, um, I would say, given the opportunity to have an immune response that's much more protective. And the research actually, even the recent research on COVID has proven what we already have known from the principles of immunology and virology and infectious diseases. None of the principles that we're discussing is anything new. It's just a different pathogen. I would have loved people so to have panicking. Seen... Why are people so scared of this virus more than they have been from uh, other vi types of viruses? Why? Why is this COVID thing caused so much um, uh, damage? Uh, I mean, e emotional, mental, physical damage. Uh, you you're making. Uh, I mean, if I understand you correctly, you're, you're saying that uh, it's not as as uh, it's not any different than any other virus, or is it? Well, there. There is a, within this contract, within its own collection of species, it's the eighth version. So we've already been exposed to this particular Translate, of please, in terms that, that we can understand. It's, meaning is the eighth, eighth recognized and sequenced variants. Now, in between, there's been other variants, but this is okay. the eighth one. OK, and so it's been in the general population globally, most likely outside of the United States. Because, again, we're going back to what constitutes rules of healthcare options, access to healthcare, practical implementations of healthcare, and all that constitutes what actually happens in real time in the geoposition of the community. So with respect to um, your first, uh, your, your question, pointed question, and I, I'm glad you brought it up, the reason why the fear has been promulgated is simply because it has been politicized. That's the truth. The reality is that when you take clinicians and experts out of the equation, when you don't give them the opportunity to speak in the media, when you give when you don't give the platform to the interdisciplinary medical professionals, including ER, immunologists, virologists, dentists, um, um, you know, again, uh, internal medicine, uh, infectious disease specialists, when you don't allow the experts to lead, it absolutely becomes a detrimental point. And here's the other reality and facts, which I would love for the audience to really grasp. When we look at innovation, whether it's a vaccine or a therapeutic device or a protocol, 50% of the equation for that output or success depends on the R&D community, the academia, as well as the FDA and the EPA, all the OSHA, all the regulatory bodies that constitute and valid, um, um, give credibility to say, okay, you can market it. But the other 50%, and I wanted you to pay very close attention to this, the other 50% has is dependent on the necessity for a private care clinician, which constitutes the mass distribution portal of healthcare commodity to the masses in the United States, as the system here has been settled for decades. So the, the clinician then takes that particular product or protocol and then customizes it for his or her patient. That is absolutely key. It's a premise. It's an assumption in the training of medicine. And this is what we do. However, this has been somewhat ignored in the past 10, 15 years. And COVID has basically surfaced what has been lurking underneath, if you will, in terms of setbacks in the healthcare system. So um, having said that, you've noticed that in the public domain, at least in the United States, there's just been some express type of transfer without incorporating the clinical uh, voice in the private sector. Hence, clinicals, clinics were shut down. Uh, the uh, clinical uh, repertoire of access to patients was interrupted. Um, there were obstacles to even to allow for the practitioner to do and practice medicine for what it has for what he or she has trained, whereas a non-expert or a coalescent of municipalities or governmental implications or or, or position, which is a non-expert, doesn't have a license to practice as far as last I checked. And yet it has precipitated an absolute, I would say, result of panic instead of allowing the, the um, patient to have access to their providers and vice versa. Before we talk about the vaccine, I'd like to ask Dr. Buni Kokar, who's with me over here on the set, if he has any, any questions or comments. No. 
I'm just impressed. I'm still watching. So you're, you're still learning good. anything? You're doing good. <laughs> yeah, I learn every time. So uh, <laughs> welcome. Okay, so Dr. Kotka, let me ask you about this vaccine. Um, uh, what's your opinion about the vaccine? Let me start with that. Okay, so here's the here's the concerning factor. The FDA panel, which voted on the Pfizer vaccine, um, one of the individuals who was on the panel was from University of Michigan Hospital. So obviously, um, my alma mater and where I've trained has a, a very great deal of contribution uh, and impression on me. And um, uh, of course, uh, they're always leaders globally. Um, the concerns that some of the panelists had was because of the short duration of, of application, whereas not a lot of information was able to be actually released to the public, what I mean by the public, to the expert, experts like me, to really know what is it that is in that vaccine. When I look at the product as a clinician, right, and I basically render it to my patient here, Everything is FDA approved. Everything is crossed by all the other NGOs or the other governmental entities, including and led by the self-autonomous body of dentistry and medicine. Having said that, this particular vaccine is an mRNA vaccine. We're going to get into technical terms here now. The mRNA vaccine has been a point of research for a long time. It's a very potent approach or mechanism. The reason is, is because it actually gives the DNA type um, collection of access and viruses, bacteria, cells are made by our creator to be exceptionally smart. So therefore you have to be absolutely scrutinizing the mechanism by which you're gonna trick the body to amplify a response that's going to be positive for it without liabilities. So when I look at a vaccine, I look at what it's made of. I don't have access to that information. As a matter of fact, it's, you know, it's basically hidden in patent processing, as well as the other concerning factor as a clinician is that there's absolutely no liabilities to any manufacturer for this particular product. I have yet to practice for the past 17 plus years uh, in a situation when I'm promoting a product that basically the manufacturer has been waived their viabilities. And that is something that um, is a question mark for me. Uh, on the other hand, the comorbidities um, make the scenario and the case just as much as for a healthy individual. The vaccine, even if it's, let's say, an mRNA vaccine, and it's exceptionally potent just because of the electronics, if you will, of the mechanism, Still, so far, we have not really been able, from a research perspective, to conquer this particular type of concept as well in the general population. Basically, what I'm seeing in healthcare, that instead of really optimizing and addressing the comorbidities of the population, which, by the way, 20% of the patients, and uh, sorry, 20% of the patients uh, that basically participate in the, uh, in the, you know, in the medical, uh, care system actually constitutes for 80% of the costs. So when you look at exactly what actually drives this particular innovation process and how quickly it's actually moving, there's sort of like a lagging behind in terms of conquering things from the past in a way that is much more productive for the mass population, but at the same time, not giving up the customization product, uh, the customization approach, because that's absolutely key. From a perspective of mass distribution analysis, you have to basically homogenize profiles, systemic profiles. Well, you're very unique. So am I. So is Pastor Kokar. So is everybody else. From a perspective of trying to get things to reach people in general, homogenizing makes sense, but only up to a certain percent, probably 50%. The other part of the equation is the customization aspect. So going back to the COVID vaccine, what do I think of it? The individual in this particular case has just as much as a of a risk, I would say, whether or not they're dealing with the comorbidities de novo, meaning um, themselves without the actual vaccine for COVID, or whether they're going through the COVID portal. N no matter what, the exposure is probably equivalent from a comorbidity perspective, with some spikes depending on which, you know, which uh, disease factors there, like, for instance, diabetes, cardiovascular, respiratory conditions. Um, however, when I look at the outcome, what do I get instead? 
is that without the vaccine, if the immune system wins, it's a full win. You're protected for next variant. You're protected for variant after that. But with the vaccine, that's certainly not so, most likely in larger, uh, I would say, indications. What are you so, saying? So are you saying that it's, uh, it could be that you're better off without it? Yes. Absolutely, because here's the bottom line. Um, when the immune system sees a virus, right, it's going to see the whole virus, just like it is. So as the immune system response is as good as, as the health of the individual, of the host. So if the person is healthy, they're going to generate a comprehensive, they're going to knock it out of the part, they don't even have a symptom. So they're asymptomatic. Now they have antibodies built that are complete. They've seen the entire virus. The body has seen everything. No hidden aspects. When you take medic when you take the vaccine, the vaccine highlights a particular segment only of the virus. So, in the immune response, you only get the antibody lock against that particular segment. Now, when they've done studies recently on the COVID vaccine, antibody response, and they compared it to the uh, immune, natural uh, immune response, they realized that, yes, they definitely get a very high peak of antibodies against that particular segment. But they also concluded that to overcome physiologically in terms of health, meaning beating the COVID disease, which is caused by the COVID virus, you actually need more than that. That means you need the other types of segments part of it for the body to build antibodies to that. And the data indicates that the individuals that have had that type of uh, exposure by, the, by their immune system are the ones that win against the virus and therefore eliminate the disease more effectively and in more numbers. So for those that uh, don't have that immune system um, strength to fight it, would it be helpful? So that's the very, a very intelligent question. So you have to look at what type of comorbidities or dysfunction that individual has. And I'm gonna go back to something I said earlier. Just because somebody has a condition and they're taking medications for it, does not mean that they've healed the, or addressed the underlying mechanism of what rendered or concluded that disease. It just means, it can mean that it's just a Band-Aid. The test results come back that is normal, but it doesn't mean that it healed your body where there has been deficiency. So what happens is, is you can't forget that you're still deficient, you're still lacking. So when you now are exposed to a virus and you have things like that are more uh, serious in nature, like diabetes, which basically affects the system overall, or you have other neurologic based conditions, or you have a respiratory type condition, your best approach is to tackle the situation with boosting the immune system locally. And for instance, we know when we look at the entry point of a pathogen, we have to recognize that it takes only a certain amount of concentration. It has to meet that threshold of dose. Just one or two, four or five particles isn't gonna cut it, even in probably comorbidity patients. Um, the actual COVID virus is basically totally diluted by the saliva. It actually has to tag on to receptors that are in the back of the throat and some on the tongue, in the back of the tongue. So it has to have this, a certain modality of entry, a certain predisposition because Im immediately the immune response is there, even locally. And once it passes the threshold of progress, that's when it has more of a re-entry point. And the problem with these mRNA uh, viruses, um, particularly, uh, which is, you know, brings the uh, subject to another incredibly um, important aspect of the research, you know, uh, do we actually, uh, you know, are we, is it ethical to build more potent pathogen in the laboratory so that we can essentially, um, um, I would say, speculate where the pathogens will be in the future? Are we really doing more harm with that type of approach? And probably that's a question and discussion for another time. But currently to the, to the question at hand, um, 
the the aspect of the coordination of analysis between the diseases of a particular patient involves an absolute intimate conversation with their interdisciplinary team. So the patient really understands what are the most dangerous conditions the patient has, what um, would constitute the risks, and the reality is that the patient has a lot more arsenal of options and solutions at their fingertips than they think. The concept, I think, in the United States has been, I think, a slippery slope into the thinking that patients ought to depend on medications to become healthy. And that's not so. I see clinical protocol. I see myself. I see medical technology, uh, including medicine, as a bridge during a specific amount of time to help the patient obtain a better footing, if you will, but then to address what caused the situation in the first place. And when we're talking about predisposing factors in terms of immune response, it's really about weight, it's about circulation, it's about agility, and it's about um, you know choosing therapeutic solutions and choosing interdisciplinary medical professionals who focus on mechanism, who will help boost the individual's overall health capacity and functionality such that they will respond and repair. It's incredible how God made us, you know? Even though their deficiencies and their basically liabilities of the pathologies of history, still, with today's technologies, we actually even have even a better opportunity to uh, conquer things in a more effective way uh, to obtain that overall health function that basically translates with time and is easily maintainable. And by the way, even though I am in aesthetics, aesthetics cannot be built without health. So going back to the comorbidity situation, my recommendation to my patients, as well as to everyone I speak with, interdisciplinary discussions with an interdisciplinary team who basically have the vision and the focus to help the patient understand where their bodies are failing, what the intermediate solutions are, what the liabilities and risks are, because there's always going to be a cost and price, and where do they expect to be? And then the other part of the equation, majority, uh, is the patient conduct at home, the patient's lifestyle choices, discipline-based obedience. And I hate to say it that way, but I know in the spiritual sense, we're accustomed to that, and we need to translate it as well you know, in the practical sense. Well, um, I appreciate your expertise. Um, one last question. Uh, we're running a, a, we're, uh, at the end of our time. Uh, are you going to be vaccinated or have you been? Um, not currently. I'm actually, um, I need to be in the most, um, I would say, overall healthy position for my patients and um, for myself, first of all. I have to take care of myself in order to, care, to take care of my patients. So I would say that I can only, of course, uh, you know, pray that, uh, um, you know, that I remain um, as healthy as I've been gifted and blessed. And I hope that also others can enjoy the same, you know, the same type of results. It's, uh, it's, it's an in intricate uh, um, opportunity, I think, to be allowed to um, physiologically build immunity um, and, um, you know, to, to conquer. And so um, I, you know, I, I think that um, currently this particular virus does not necessarily constitute for me to consider that approach. Last question, why is the government insisting everybody gets vaccinated, in your, in your so, opinion? Certainly. So to answer that question, and in my experience here on Capitol Hill, since the days when I started uh, um, essentially lobbying with the American Dental Association as a student in 2001, um, to understand healthcare commodity and exchange, as well as access, as well as options of treatment, one has to understand several things. The participants who actually promulgate this mass distribution of options involve naturally large entities. And in the United States, the government has contributed and does appropriate uh, through funding 
um, its own arm of research, but also to the private sector. The best coordination on earth, since we're not in heaven, uh, is basically this coordination between, uh, you know, a government type or, or large organization type um, distribution, if you will, or access of platform distribution so you can give access to the absolute minimum available. But at the same time, equally, I don't mean under, I mean equally, to allow for competition. And these, that is a very difficult balance to achieve. But it is, United States has shown that to be effective, at least in the past few decades. Recently, it has really come under attack for the reasons I've explained earlier, because in the last decade or so, we've seen that there's been a shift. There's just been basically um, some of the participants in healthcare have just really uh, been allowed to thread very fast forward. And the experts, unfortunately, in my opinion, have sort of fallen asleep at the wheel. And that's the reason why it's important to work with government to obtain the, um, uh, first of all, to give input, because even the government is still at the peril of the expert. And at the same time, um, to understand what other participant constitutes decision-making processes, meaning insurance uh, networks will definitely have a dictation in terms of patients' op uh, access and patient options. We know that managed care, point of service versus PPO versus fee-for-service will definitely render completely different gamut of options in treatment as well as medical devices, simply because insurances are a business. And you have to understand that as a consumer and being able to understand where your essentially access of information comes from, who are your team um, looking at, for instance, you know, the um, credentials, you know, of the individuals, the training, uh, the, the participation and also the approach of logic of, of, of I would say, integrity, you know, biblical type of logic in terms of pursuing the truth to actually understand what the conditions are um, with the respective uh, um, liabilities, cost, etc., but longitudinally positioning in a more productive and much more, uh, I would say, healthier position. So the government has large contracts with interest parties as well as companies. So it's much easier to, to penetrate the market and to launch a product when you have a large purchaser, right? Hence, one, I'll leave you with this one example. And the reason why I mentioned this is because the reason why I'm in Washington, D.C., simply for this reason, I like to ensure that mechanism driven protocols protocols which are uh, have a basically conscientious responsibility in reflecting and respecting the natural processes are the best option solutions for the human body and therefore those protocols ought to be given priority to the market because those are the ones that are going to have the impact however the other participants of the healthcare sector basically because their goals are different their financial, their, um, uh, you know, uh, legislative, uh, their uh, negotiated, etc. Everybody has an agenda and understanding that agenda will tell you what type of product um, quality you will be able to receive. So I'll leave you with this example. Everybody knows about Elizabeth Holmes, uh, Holmes uh, saga. She raised over $500 million, $500 million for a basically a product and a concept which scientists even at Stanford said, you can't do it. And yet $500 million were allocated to the incorrect protocol. Now tell me something, ask me how many times I've seen protocols that our patients need that in such in time, you actually see a much higher prevalence of the abnormalities in the population just because the protocol doesn't make it out. And I'll give you an example. Everybody has heard of the obstructive sleep apnea condition, correct? It's now become almost, you know, a household name. That particular condition certainly has reaches and roots of dysfunction in cardiovascular neurology, but also from temporal mandibular disorders. As a clinician who focuses on lasers and temporal mandibular disorders and OSA treatment, um, and have done that for a long time, given University of Michigan training, which has 
uh, decades of research on this particular uh, backdrop of, uh, of conditions. Um, the implementation of the right mechanism protocol, it's key not only to the resolve of the condition, but the maintenance. So therefore, I can take a laser, I can take electrical stimulation, we can take opioids, we can take neuromuscular, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, medications, but all those have very short acting effects. Hence, I don't choose to apply that solution. I go to the mechanism um, driven analysis to identify where's the deficiency in the system, in the head and neck, where does it have roots in the overall systemic profile, and then I build on that a solution that constitutes rehabilitation in which the body itself starts to be promoted to heal itself. So the coordination between the clinician's effort and the various different components in the technology com uh, sector um, can actually render much more effective penetration of the protocols. So I can tell you that oral appliances, um, of course, are not as popular, uh, you know, uh, particularly at least not the right, um, I would say, uh, the effective prescription appliances are not as popular because first of all they are um uh, you have to really address the you know underlying uh, condition it takes time uh you know it's not a simple conversation and the treatment you know uh, certainly is not as quick and easy as a laser uh, one two three or an electrical stimulation uh three four five or a medication which essentially the media has allowed for the consumers to be attenuate uh sorry uh, to be almost um customized to, you know, um, quick and easy, do it now, um, and you're done. And so having said that, um, you know, I'll leave, I'll leave it at this. It makes for an absolute um, um, responsible uh, effort, both on behalf of the patient to seek information, to seek participants, to help themselves understand um, what the conditions they actually have, not be intimidated by the unknown, obtain information and pursue it, become an advocate for yourself, for your family members, because it will pay off in the long term in terms of your own health, as well as the health of your community, as well as the decision-making uh, options given uh, at the larger level. So choosing uh, the, cl the, the clinicians choosing and the customers essentially effectively choosing and allowing for the best recommendation by the clinician actually has a massive impact indirectly on what happens on Capitol Hill. Dr. Kotka, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we're at the end of our segment, but you are welcome to come back. Um, Dr. Claudia Kotka is the founder of the Washington Institute for Dentistry and Laser Surgery in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for your time today.